Hello, good evening and welcome to the business of property. I'm your host, Cheryl Leong from Property Development Australia. I'm going to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we virtually meet today and pay respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. At the business of property, we interview superstar guests in the property development space that share their expertise, their deals, their stories to help empower, build and grow our community of developers. So hello to Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube land. Oh, wherever you are. Give me a shout out if you're here with us today in the comments below. Um, and what we have, we have an, actually an old friend. He's not old, but I'm saying that we've known each other since high school days in Brisbane. And he's now the planning manager of a very reputable town planning firm, DTS Group. And he has over the years actually done something with himself and utilized and built uh, an extensive experience in the preparation, lodgement, management and assessment of development applications throughout Queensland, particularly land subdivisions. So I'm going to invite um, into the business of property today, Tim Smith from DTS Group. Tim, how are you doing? Hey everyone, how are we? Excellent. So Tim, tell us a bit about your journey into property and in particular town planning. Yeah, well, look, sure, it's come a long way since we did manual arts and graphics together through <laughs> high school. So um, obviously that was sort of the founding of my, um, you know, planning and uh, planning interest through geography, legal studies, graphics, mm -hmm. those sorts of subjects at school. Um, went to university uh, up here in Brisbane, Queensland, did the Bachelor of Urban Design and uh, a graduate diploma QT. Uh, from there, just went through and, and started like, I guess, the rest of us. Um, student planner placements or graduate planner placements for those of us that are planners. Um, but across all of our industries, I'm sure we've all started as uh, students or graduates in our respective mm -hmm. fields. Um, started in consultancy planning, uh, did that for a couple of years, uh, and then found my way into local government up here in southeast Queensland, uh, where I worked in the local government for around about three years. It was an interesting time when I was there because we were part of the uh, amalgamation of local governments here in Queensland back in 2005, 2006. Uh, I was also at that local authority at the time of a new planning scheme. So it was kind of exciting to be part of those periods of change. Uh, pretty much did my three years there, felt like I'd achieved enough, I'd served the community and went back into the private sector. Um, went into the, to the private sector for another six years and then found myself back at the same local government that I'd left earlier. Um, and, uh, and that was a great role that I had at that local government. Um, we were a much bigger organisation by that point, certainly post amalgamation. Uh, and I fulfilled the role of the coordinator for DA planning for around about four years before finding myself back here at DTS uh, in private consultancy where I've been for the last four years. So yeah, certainly seen a little bit through, um, through the different spheres of consultancy planning and also local government planning in two different stints. For those of us that have worked in local government or work with local governments, um, I'm sure we all know the challenges that those experiences have. Um, politically, different environments and, and policy changes, and you're always responding to you know, different influences over the, over the years, and you're nothing static. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was a great, great opportunity to sort of see what it's like from a local government perspective and, and start to apply that um, and, and try and serve my clients here in the private sector. Fantastic. And, and would it be right to say that the fact that you have been on the inside <laughs> to, to a certain extent, you're able to um, navigate planning and applications a lot better? better i guess is that the right right way to look at it yeah look i, I like to think so cheryl um obviously having spent i guess you know seven eight years you know all up working in local government uh i've seen the various applications come in and look i can't speak for every local authority of course um but using that that experience of being being inside um mm -hmm. knowing how 
you know, the, the, the DA teams have to manage all of the competing interests from you know, the internal referrals to the community, to the local councillor, um, to, to upholding the council policy. Uh, it's quite a good bit of that insight that, you know, in, in this private world that I find myself in, you know, trying to work out where, where you can kind of push on the policy, um, you know, understanding where council officers are likely to understand and, and appreciate maybe some commercial realities about being, being pragmatic and deciding it in a particular way or where they're going to hold firm because that's where the policy position of the local authority is and, and knowing that they've got to uphold that community expectation. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so where are you seeing now in and and, and predominantly South East Queensland? Mm. What what what's happening? What are the, what are the trends and the types of application? Are you seeing some sort of trend in 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 the um popularity of some sort of uh developments as opposed to others? Yeah, certainly. I mean, the market here uh, appears to be shifting more and towards the the freehold lot space and it has over the last couple of years. Uh, I guess the last major probably boom that SEQ had, there seemed to be a lot of focus on multiple dwellings, apartments, um, and intensifying mm. land uses in that respect. Uh, and don't get me wrong, that, those, those style of developments still predominant today. Um, but, you know, with, with things, particularly over the last couple of years with, you know, COVID and, and we had the home builder stimulus last year and, and these sorts of things, um, you know, the ageing population, the growing population, um, you know, the, the, the need to supply affordable housing product in reasonably mm. good locations mm. is really driving development to the outskirts of particularly in Brisbane. Um, you know, and you're looking towards your Western Growth Corridor, towards Ipswich. That's always been a, a hot spot. Um, you know, uh, around Logan in particular, you look at the suburbs like Park Ridge and Logan Reserve, and there's a lot of subdivision activity happening down there. Uh, up through the Morton Bay Regional Council area, you know, you've got Narang Bar, Moray Field, mm -hmm. Burpengary, yeah. and then up through, you know, Caloundra with the, the big Stocklands developments there as well. Um, yeah. You know, all kind of on the, the fringe of the main periphery of the, the you know, Brisbane Centre or Maroochydore or, you know, around that sort of Springwood um, Centre in Logan. But, you know, they're able to provide these uh, alternative housing products, you know, diversity yeah. and lot sizes, uh, Little bit more affordable uh, and, and providing that product in, in, a, in a location where it's still reasonably close to, to services, highways, schools, mm -hmm. mm. universities and the like. Yeah and and you know I'm hearing a lot from whether it's real estate agents or buyers or developers that there's not enough stock at the oh. moment. Absolutely, and, and I'm, I'm sure you're hearing that. So, is there, you know, is it because of the the lack of um, the government releasing land for development, or what? What's the deal there? Yeah, look, I guess part of the challenge is you've got these competing ideals and competing thoughts. Where the state who uh, here in South East Queensland has defined an urban footprint. I know that's a similar concept to other parts of the country, uh, e.g. Melbourne. So there's an urban footprint which defines the urban growth and everything beyond that is rural or agricultural and pretty much off limits to urban development. So from that respect, when you're looking at southeast Queensland, we're kind of tied into this, this urban footprint area. Now, within that, there's no uh, detailed assessment of the, the, the land value or the quality of that land for urban development. So the urban footprint in the regional plan for southeast Queensland still captures everything which is impacted by regulated vegetation or koala habitat. Uh, might be unsuitable because it's flooded and dated. Um, might be unsuitable because it's earmarked for industrial development. So all, all of a sudden you've got quite a large number um, being an area that's set aside for urban development and then you keep chipping away as you start taking out all of these constrained pieces of land. So. Yeah. You've got the conflict there where the, I guess the, the number that's portrayed as being available in terms of land supply is probably not realistic. Um, mm. And the uptake as well of, of growth. So we all know that South East Queensland has been you know, a, a targeted area for a long time for uh, interstate migration, but also overseas arrivals. It, it slowed up a little bit for a couple of years. But again, with the world changing in the last 18 months to two years, 
um, when the borders are open, there's a lot of people coming into Queensland. Uh, and we've seen that anecdotally through a number of people that have relocated their families or have looked to relocate once the borders are open. And, and so there seems to be this massive migration of, of Southerners from Victoria and Islam into Queensland. Because um, we're sick of getting locked, oh, well, not, locked down. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, we don't, we don't do lockdowns up no. here too often. No, we you, do them short and sharp. Look how relaxed you look. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff happening outside, so it's uh, not always relaxing. But, yeah, well, hopefully yeah, the borders are open as of uh, next week, I think. Mm. So, uh, yeah, what we'll see is we'll, we'll see much more of that growth coming in. And, um yeah. And that's now starting to chip away, possibly, at, at, at that land supply that, you know, when we looked at the regional plan last couple of years ago, as part of the last revision, the forecast growth um, is obviously considered in terms of determining whether or not there's sufficient land. And, and I think perhaps with the, the, the growth that we're seeing in Queensland, particularly southeast Queensland, over the last 18 months, and what's likely to occur over the next 18 to 24 yeah, possibly we're going to be eroding that supply a little bit more quickly as well. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, like there's 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 one part of talking about sort of large rezoning and and subdivision, yep. um, which also you know you're talking about migration. That's which is why we're seeing a whole lot of interest in the small lot subdivision space yep. as well. Which is what we like to talk about today. Which is around you know our whole topic is mastering subdivision projects in southeast mm. Queensland. So. Mm. Um, just so happened you put it together a presentation for us to go through to highlight some of the things for developers here who are looking to sub do subdivision in Queensland. Let's bring that up and let's go through a few things here. Yeah, great. And so anyone that's listening, if you're doing subdivisions, particularly the small lot subdivisions in Queensland, you might be doing large lot subdivisions, got questions for, for Tim, feel free to pop it in the comments below Absolutely. as well. And so hopefully Sheena can help us with, oh, I think you. There it is. There we go. There you are. That's great. So, yeah, as I said, I've put together this PowerPoint. It's not a long one. Um, I haven't gone into a heap of detail on it. Uh, I'm obviously conscious of the fact that I'm here in, in Brisbane. Um, we've got all of you guys, some in Brisbane, some interstate, uh, and you're all looking at different subdivision projects. So I've tried to keep this reasonably broad there are some some localized um, specifics at the end but hopefully there's some things there that you can um, i suppose take away and apply to your own circumstances um, in your own geographic areas as well mm. so i'll just um, i'll just click through a couple of these slides now master and subdivisions is you know it, it's something we're all trying to do um, it's not always easy but i tried to break it down into half a dozen I guess, key things or, or, or elements to, uh, to consider. It's understanding the why, understanding the who, understanding the where, understanding the what, the how, and then I try and capture some key thoughts and learnings in the final slide. So very broadly, understand the why, how we, how we do develop, the why we do development, and that's through this legislation process, this regulatory process. So. It may not be the easiest slide to, uh, to, to see, depending on how you're viewing this. Um, appreciate that. Don't expect you to go into all the detail there, but it's just breaking down that here in Queensland, we've got legislation, uh, state plan instruments, statutory instruments, and local plan instruments. They're our four key tenants of how we operate the planning framework. Um, the uh, legislation is clearly the Planning Act, here in Queensland, Plan Act 2016, uh, very imaginatively named. We used to be integrated, we used to be sustainable, now we're just the Planning Act. Uh, we've got the PE Court Act that sits in behind that, and the planning regulation, which also gives weight and support to the Planning Act. State planning instruments are things like our state planning policy. So over the years, Queensland developed all of these different SPPs. Um, targeted on specific issues or elements. So you might have had an SPP for aviation facilities, an SPP for agriculture, an SPP for extractive industry. And the list went on. It was all covering the various state interests. A couple of years ago, probably about 10 years ago, it was all consolidated into a single SPP. Uh, and that sits as, a, as the highest document in our planning framework. 
it's something that all planning schemes have to sort of bind to as well when they go through a, a state planning check. Um, statutory planning instruments are things like the minister's guidelines. Uh, the minister has a set of rules as to how a local authority can establish a planning scheme, how they can amend a planning scheme, how they may want to introduce a temporary local planning instrument, those sorts of things. Uh, importantly for people like myself as a consultant planner, the statutory instruments also include what we call the DA rules. Again, highly imaginatively named, but the development assessment rules take out, I guess, a lot of the fundamental parts of the Act in the day-to-day -day practice of urban planning or development assessment. So that's our rules as to how we progress an application in terms of uh, timeframes. Once we do one thing, what's the next step? Yeah. Who's responsible for what? And how we go from lodgement to a decision. Uh, our local planning instruments is pretty much our planning schemes. So every local authority in Queensland has a planning scheme. Some of them have uh, schemes that are quite old. Um, generally, the, the uh, I suppose, less equipped uh, councils or the smaller councils will, will carry through an older scheme through a number of different pieces of legislation, you know, possibly from the Sustainable Planning Act or the Integrated Planning Act and earlier. Um, more of the urbanised councils, the larger councils, will update their planning schemes more frequently. And you'll often see people like Brisbane City Council or councils like Brisbane City Council will update their schemes several times a year. That all falls into that local planning instruments. I'll just and, jump through it. Sorry. And sorry. out of this, so Tim, I mean, for the everyday, everyday developer, um, which of these instruments should they be at very least be familiar with? Sure. Yeah. No, the, the local planning instruments. Mm -hmm. I guess as you embark on your development projects, you will be engaging with your consultant team. So you will have some planning specialists on board and it'll be people like us that will navigate the act, mm -hmm. the regulatory steps, how you go from A to B to C to D. Um, if you wanted that, that understanding, I guess, of the process, where the rubber hits the ground is your local planning instrument. Mm -hmm. That's where you can find your zoning, uh, find out your site cover for multiple dwelling units, the minimum lot size for subdivisions and so forth. So it, it's definitely having that, at least that awareness about yeah. what your local planning instrument is, um, where you can find it, how it operates and how to navigate through it. And I can show you some quick slides on that one later on as well. Awesome. So the Who, well, the Who's actually an old British band, but look, you can read that more later on Wikipedia, so we'll, uh, we'll skip over that one. But who, who else is the Who? So the Who is also the state government. It's also your local authorities. So who is a decision maker? It could be one of either, or it could be both. So I guess what's important to note when you're dealing with subdivisions here in Queensland, uh, depending on where you are, and again, I've got more slides on this, so it may make a little bit more sense as we progress through the presentation. But your decision maker may very well be the state government in the instances where you are doing development or subdivision in what we call a priority development area. More often than not, though, your decision maker will be the local authority. Occasionally, you will find yourself with an application that still requires the state assessment through a referral agency but your decision maker will still be your local authority. So it's important to understand in preparing an application or, or, or embarking on a development, who is going to be the decision maker. Mm -hmm. Now, the who is not just limited to the decision maker. It's who you are, who your project team is, who do you need to talk to to get the best of your development. So who do you need to engage when you go about making a subject application? Well, Clearly, you need a surveyor. You probably need an urban planner. Do you need an engineer? You know, do you need an urban designer? Do you need an ecologist? Do you need an acoustic engineer? Do you need any of these other experts? So in, in thinking about how you assemble a project team, you've got to really do the, the, the um, investigation, I guess, into the site, where it sits in the planning framework, uh, understand its constraints and its opportunities and, and start to really form a project team that you can rely on around that to navigate you through each of those different areas of expertise to make the application process, I guess, as streamlined and as smooth as possible. 
So understanding the where. Now, these are some of those areas that I referred to earlier. So are you in a PDA, a product development area? Now, within a product development area, is the, sorry, is the assessment manager the Economic Development Queensland or is it the local government? Mm -hmm. Is there a plan of development in place that sets the development provisions? Is there a precinct plan which dictates your land use or your subdivision lot sizes? Are there zonings? The same can be said with your local planning scheme. And to Cheryl's earlier question, this is the area where you probably want to spend most of your time becoming familiar because you need to understand is your site within the priority infrastructure area of your local government infrastructure plan. Broadly, that's the area where council has earmarked urban development, um, mm. has costed out the infrastructure supply where there is infrastructure. Um, that correlates back to your zoning, to your precincts. Do you have overlays? Are you in a local plan? So straight away, you can see there's a lot more to the planning scheme than just your zoning, because at any one of those points, be it an overlay or a local plan, it can take you down these other little sort of pathways of discovery. State overlays, don't forget those, because no matter what a planning scheme might say, there might be a state interest that sits on top. Mm -hmm. um, my list here is not exhaustive. You know, koalas, heritage, State transport, remnant veg, um, coastal matters, extractive industries. These are all just um, yeah, initial ones, but there's a whole lot of other state interests which may uh, apply to, to the site or to the circumstances of your development, which you really have to get your head around, again, with your project team of experts mm -hmm. to navigate any possible referral that you might have to the state. And, and in terms of, again, the everyday developer, Yep. Have, doing their initial due diligence when they're just sort of skimming through hundreds of sites, where can they pick up all this sort of, in, you know, overlays and schemes? Where do they need to be able to go to as a first instance? Yeah, I think that might actually be on the next one. I shall, I'll just, we can park that for the moment, show because I do okay. actually sort of point right. you towards that. So uh, understanding the what. So... I guess this is just a, a quick slide to, to, to make people aware that here in Queensland, we do have pre development. But we've also got accepted development, which may not require a planning application or development approval. More often than not, though, you'll find the development probably sits in the third one. So accessible development. Within accessible development, we've got code and impact assessment. Those are just two different ways in which a development application may be assessed and whether or not an application requires things like public notification. Mm. I don't want to sort of spend too much time on that because I think Cheryl's question was quite useful before. And it's now understanding the how. So how do we find out all of this information that you guys need to know at your DD stage or as you're making an application? Um, you can see here that um, uh, most planning schemes will have a suite of PDFs of all of their maps, all of their overlays, all of their zones. Quite often, you'll have a, a regional council or a shire that big and it'll be divided into a grid and you've got to try and navigate your way through, you know, on map D4 or, or whatever it is. Um, that is useful, but most of the councils will, will also have an interactive function as well. Um, the state government has an interactive function for the, for the state referrals or those state interests. And importantly here in Queensland, or at least in South East Queensland, we've got a couple of water retailer authorities. Mm. So unlike most councils probably around the country, and certainly not unlike most councils here in Queensland, our bigger councils here in South East Queensland aren't uh, controlling of water and sewer infrastructure and assets. There's a separate entity for those. And that separate entity is shared across a number of different local government areas. So, for example, um, Morton Bay Regional Council and the Sunshine Coast Regional Council are supplied by Uniwater. Uh, Brisbane City Council, Ipswich have urban utilities. So when you want to start looking at your water infrastructure, your sewer connections, all of these sorts of things, you don't go to Brisbane City Council, you don't go to Ipswich City Council, you don't go to Morton Bay Regional Council because they'll just send you back to the, the Water Authority, which is Uni Water, 
and urban utilities. So they've also got interactive mapping. And, and what is great, I guess, is that across most of these councils, and certainly those two water entities, they use a fairly similar um, data set and, and online function. And if you ever have a chance to explore these interactive maps, I'm sure you'll find that there are familiarities between that system and the local authorities that you're used to dealing with across the country or across the state. I'm sure it's a, a, you know, a common data set at the end. Yeah, yeah. So here's just one example of, of a site assessment. Um, this is our office here in South Brisbane. Um, and, and I say start with the state interests because the state interests obviously prevail in, in a regulatory sense. And it's also the area that you want to square away that you've, you've got no concerns there. You, know, you want to avoid seeing multiple colours and, and things hatched across your site. Mm. Now, this is obviously an urban environment here in South Brisbane where we are. Um, but what you can see on, on this one here, there's a link. Um, you're not going to remember that link, but you can always just do a Google search for SARA DA mapping, S-A-R-A DA mapping. That will take you to the State Assessment Referral Agency here in Queensland. And you can then start to you know, determine and ascertain where some of your state interests might lie in relation to your site. So to the left of the screen, you can see that there's a number of little different subheadings. I haven't expanded on those. If you did expand on that, that would give some context to some of the colors that you can see there. But what that does, is it shows all the different state interests on the map, although it could be a little bit harder to see, but you'll see that there's different colors to map the Brisbane River, mm. um, which is the state interest, coastal matters and coastal issues. We've got some transport corridors mapped, some public transport mapped, some future tunnels mapped, and those sorts of things. So I guess in terms of, of you know, key links to, to be familiar with for subdivisions here in Queensland, this is certainly one that you'd want to bookmark mm. and check off against first. Um, you know, the first, first link there or the first option there, as you can see, is the regional plan. And, and that's where we can find where that urban footprint is. You know, you don't really want to be spending too much time thinking you've got this great site on the edge of the urban area. You can see all this development that's happened. It's a big paddock and you think, this is great. This will be the next growth front. And then you find out you're not actually in the urban footprint. So mm -hmm. this is the, the, a great tool to you know, square away what the, the, the good sites are and, and what the challenging sites are going to be from those just, interests. Just on that point, Tim, when you're talking about you know, land outside of the urban footprint. Yep. Are there still opportunities for developers to do? I mean, I'm I'm in New South Wales, and so we've got developers who might amalgamate, you know, a few hundred acres of land and do yep. sort of a spot rezoning. Yep. Is that a similar thing in Queensland, where if it's outside of that urban area, that there's still opportunities if it's close enough to rezone? Unfortunately, um, not Cheryl. <clears throat> not in terms of SEQ or Southeast Queensland. So. Mm -hmm. Within the southeast Queensland region, which extends from the border of New South Wales out to Toowoomba and up towards Gympie, uh, so just past Noosa. So that urban footprint is fixed by regulation and it's fixed by the regional plan. The regional plan is very clear through the regulatory provisions that subdivision outside of the urban footprint is limited to 100 hectares in size. So you, know, you could arguably amass a, a massive holding and you might then yield two lots out of it. Beyond the urban, sorry, beyond the southeast Queensland region, so as you get to Toowoomba and head west, or as you head north of Gympie, you're out of the reach of that SEQ regional plan. So you then come back to your local planning instrument only. You're not, you're not captured by that prohibition on subdivision. So the urban footprint is only confined to the SEQ region, and as I said, that sort of captures you know, up to mm. Gympie and, and out to Toowoomba. Yeah, that's good Good to know. So first point of call to, to head to see whether there are any particular state interests. If there are no colours and hatchings and, you know, it looks like that grey and white bit you're, and you've gone through Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty good idea that you can do something there. Then it's the next step. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, what, what this does is it just narrows down your areas of, of, um, 
I suppose, further investigation. And, and, and coming back to the to the who, you know, in terms of who are you dealing with, if you've got a site where you're all grey on this particular map, you know you're just dealing with the local authority. You don't have to deal with the state environmental department or the state transport department because you're near a state-controlled road or a, or a tunnel or those sorts of things. Now, obviously, just even on this map extract, again, because it's a highly urbanised area here in South Brisbane, you don't see a lot of green uh, other than the Brisbane River, um, which is funny because the river's brown. But the, if you were to look at, you know, um, subdivision opportunities outside of the inner city. So if, you, if you're doing, say, one into two subdivisions, um, where you might be, say, Red Hill and Brisbane or, um, yeah, down towards Spring, but you're in an urban area, then your mapping will look very much like that extract on the screen. If you're starting to find yourself looking at subdivision opportunities and projects further afield and starting to get into those larger lots, what you'll find is that uh, you know, this state map will start to show more state vegetation, which is all different colours, um, and the koala vegetation as well. And that's where this is, is pretty critical because you might see a site as in the urban footprint, you might see development all around you, but there's a couple of trees that might be scattered across the site. So you use this map to try and hone down, um, you know, are there any state interests of environmental value, mm. be it regulated vegetation or koalas, that would cause an issue later on because depending if you do have, say, a koala map overlay, you may very well fall back into that prohibited development, um, a category of development, which I had that quick screen on before, meaning you can't even make an application. So as much as our planning system in here in Queensland is performance-based and you can go, okay, well, I don't quite comply here, but here's a good alternative as to why I think I comply. Where you are prohibited, you can't do that at all. So the, the, the state mapping is critical to determining, yeah, are, are you going to be captured by the threat or the potential of a prohibition from an environmental mm -hmm. layer later on? Yeah, so simply stay away from the green stuff, the pink stuff, and anything that's multicolored. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or if you do find your site has all these different layers on it, you talk to someone like me and we try to navigate it through. Because certainly not all of these things are bad. You know, some of these yeah. things are opportunities because where you start to see um, public transport, state public transport as mapped here, that may actually give you an uplift in terms of uh, residential density or the ability to create some smaller lots because you're creating an, you know, an infill opportunity. So the layers don't always necessarily mean they're a bad thing, but mm. more often than not, you just want to keep it as easy as possible. And, and by keeping it easy as possible, you, you streamline your uh, your DA process. Fantastic. And then, so once you've done the state, the state thing, where to yep. next? So once you've done the state thing, you go to your local government, your local planning instrument. Now, this is just a, a screenshot of the landing page at Brisbane City Council, just to give you guys an idea. Um, it's a city plan link there. Um, most, as I said, most councils will have their interactive mapping available, um, but you can use this to find property reports. So you'll be able to type in a street address or you do a map search. And once you, um, you know, go through that opening screen and you start to generate the mapping, there's generally click functions everywhere that you can find your site, um, have a couple of clicks, it'll pull up details about its zoning, its areas, um, sometimes whether it's encumbered by easements. And then from there, you can choose your adventure as to where you go in terms of the information sources. Most of them will start to link back towards elements of the planning scheme, but it's a good way to get that initial impression as to, okay, do I have a residential zone or am I like a rural res or emerging community, future urban zone? Um, are there any overlays? You know, do we have a, a local environmental overlay or is there a building height overlay? Um, yeah, and, and these things that, that might influence you know, whether or not you feel that this is a good opportunity to proceed or not. So from there, the site assessment can continue. And now this is a Morton Bay example. Um, and I've used this, again, just to show that they, they all kind of look a little bit different, but they fulfill the same function. And what I'm suggesting here on this one is that do property searches of surrounding land. So 
if you're looking at a, at a parcel of land that you think has some development potential, it might be a larger block of land and you go, great, I want to subdivide this because I've just seen this development and the subdivision happening two doors down. You can actually use these tools to you know, look into that old application or that more recent application, see how council possibly assessed it, see what issues that developer may have had to encounter, how they overcame that, um, what consultants that they needed to engage you know, Was there a specific issue like a possibly an air quality issue or a bushfire management issue? So you can start to do your research about, okay, if we are to proceed with the development of this block of land, I've already got an idea as to who I need to be speaking to, where council's he head is at in terms of subdivision, you know, were they, were they against it the whole way through? And, and can you see that this was a real challenge for that last developer? Or was it quite kind of seamless, you know, provided that they had all these different reports and plans in alignment, did that application go through seamlessly? So it's, I think it's really valuable to yeah, do that research of the immediate vicinity, not just the site that you might be interested in subdividing, mm. but what, what mm. might be happening around in terms of other applications and approvals. Yeah, that's a really good point, that it's, it's to make sure that you don't have your blinkers on when you're looking at a site because there might be op other opportunities around as well yeah I think exactly, that's a really exactly. Good point. yeah and look if, if someone's path the course of the approval for you in terms of yeah you might even see yourself as having a, or, or the site you're looking at as having a particular overlay or a particular issue maybe about where its access point comes from or the shape of the lots and you've gone okay well how are we going to navigate this because you know the mapping seems to be quite clear i can see trees on the site mm, i can see mm, it's green mm. on the map but how, how do we navigate this? And if someone's gone through and been able to do some preliminary investigations that sort of shows that, well, look, the mapping's probably not right in terms of the, the habitat values, it, it then gives you some hope that, you you know, while you're engaging with ecologists, you might better ground truth the vegetation a little bit more. And, and you're going into that process, uh, I guess, with a bit of comfort that you're not wasting money or wasting time and, and just hoping for the best because there has been some successful habitat mapping in the area. And possibly, you know, it's a case that, you know, from there you can demonstrate that as much as sites might be mapped or that there might be trees that they possibly don't form a, an environmental corridor as, you know, that the scheme drafters may have uh, contemplated at the time. Mm. Got it. We've got a question here. Tim, does the SARA DA planning site show future planned infrastructure? or just existing infrastructure? No, good question. Uh, it actually shows both. So uh, from a transport perspective anyway. So the, the SARA mapping will show all of the state interest, which is state controlled roads in, in that sense and that infrastructure. Um, it will also show future state controlled roads and future state controlled tunnels and those sorts of things. Mm. Now, the trick to that is that there are some road corridors that we know about that aren't yet gazetted as future state controlled roads, so they won't appear. So there's a couple of roads through Morton Bay. Um, there's a lot of discussion about mm -hmm. the new um, uh, Bruce Highway Western alternative, and that's only come out in the last couple of weeks. Um, there's some stuff through uh, Logan around Park Ridge as well. We know that the state has an interest in some of these road corridors, but because they're not gazetted yet, they won't appear. Mm -hmm. However, when we can see um, you know, things like Cross River Rail, although that's a Brisbane City Council project, there are some state um, projects coming off that. So that will appear, particularly with tunnels and, and public transport, those sorts of things. So, yeah, it, it will show to a certain extent some of that future planned infrastructure, but um, I suppose be mindful of the fact that there might be other state projects kind of in the background, haven't mm -hmm. quite got to gazelle through Parliament and therefore they won't appear on the maps. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Good answer. Love it. Where are we going to next, Tim? Where are we going next? Um, still on soil assessment because I think this is, you know, this is the real, the, the real important stuff because, you know, at the end of the day, you guys want to be able to find all of the information at hand, start to make your own decisions. By no means, you know, uh, exclude talking to other experts and, and peers yeah. and so forth, but you want to better do your own initial assessments so that you're not, you know, going to your project team every five minutes, every time you see something on realestate.com, you know, you want to be able to do that, that self-exploration. So, you know, what is also useful to try and look for is, is, you know, 
whether a council or, or um, a regional council or a city council that you're dealing with, if they've got a subscription service, and I guess if you are finding yourself doing more and more and more projects in those local government areas, whether or not there's an opportunity for you to make that subscription. I guess in, in the, so the case that we've got here is Brisbane City Council's eBuyMap system. Now, it's probably a little bit unaffordable for most people, but fortunately, consultants will all subscribe to this. So this is where building your project team and building on those relationships with planners and engineers and then life that you trust, you know, we can use these subscriptions that we have to find more information. So some councils won't have this, some will, as I said. You know, I guess in, in Brisbane's example, which is what this eBuy map does, we can see a lot more infrastructure mapping through property connections, storm water, uh, mm. and there's a whole lot of this stuff that, that doesn't appear on the city plan interface. So it's, it's an evolution of more detail to the stuff that city plan won't show. Other local authorities though, and, and I'm thinking Moreton Bay, you can probably get a fair bit of information without having a subscription service because Uni Water will have their water and sewer assets available through their free mapping. And the Morton Bay Council also has their own ArcGIS suite of maps, which includes things like their stormwater assets. Those things won't normally appear in their planning scheme maps, but mm -hmm. between you know, those different websites, you can start to build that picture of all of those um, there's infrastructure items that you might be interested to find out, you know, what, what exists in terms of, you know, um, sewer manholes and water connections and, you know, where the closest, um, you know, um, regional stormwater basin is and those sorts of things. So, yeah, this is more just, a, uh, I suppose, a heads up that if you are dealing with consultants, see if they've got access to any subscription-based services across the local authorities that you're dealing with because you might just better get a little bit more information that you can't see at that public interface. Mm. Um, I think I'm getting near the end of the, the presentation, but this is just, again, an extract of the uni water mapping that I was referring to. So this is, a, in instance, this is the Red Cliff, part of the Redcliffe Peninsula. It's in the Moreton Bay region, but the, the water and sewer assets are, are, are governed by uni water. So this is the uni water map. And again, this is a free, uh, website you can freely access. As you can see from here, you can pick up all of your um, valves, manholes, pipes, and you can click on each particular asset and infrastructure to get to the point where you can see that you have a manhole at a particular RL, you've got a pipe which mm. comes in and it's 150 millimeter PVC. So you can get a whole of this information for free um, and, and navigate a way around and um, and that will give you a good picture as to, look, if you are then starting to subdivide, you can start to form some, some good views as to whether or not there's sufficient capacity yes. to network. Yep. Um, yep. You know, if you can see there's a really small pipe and you're trying to you know, subdivide into maybe five lots, you can start yep. to then put some thought to, okay, do we need to do some external upgrades? Otherwise, you know, you're going to be pretty well okay. Mm. And how does this differ or complement sort of Dial Before You Dig? Look, Dial, Dial Before You Dig is useful because you want to be able to know what is nearby, but mm. Dial Before You Dig isn't entirely accurate. Like, it's pretty good. Like, you want to be able to know, okay, here's my block of land. If I'm going to be starting to subdivide, I need to know that there's a sewer running through it or some telecommunications or whatever. Mm -hmm. You'll only ever truly find out where that stuff exactly is by engaging the services of our utility scanner, which is effectively a surveyor for underground. Yeah, these guys run around, they look like lawnmowers, but it's just radar penetrating equipment. And it really picks up with a high degree of accuracy where all of your pipes are, um, mm. where your cables are and, and those sorts of things and the depths where they sit. So Dial Before You Dig is useful. Um, it, it runs a very similar system to what this one here is. So this, this water and sewer mapping that you can see on the screen, the actual alignment of those pipes is largely a guess. However, mm. when you get to a manhole and you can see that the manhole has an invert level at a certain depth or height, you know that that's going to be pretty well accurate because that's all survey data. So, okay. it, again, it, it's all using the, the, the tools that we've got in context to start making those informed decisions about 
you know, how encumbered is my site before I start to subdivide? Um, what is the likely capacity going to be? Um, you know, and we're going to be hit with external upgrades and so forth. Mm, fantastic. Excellent. And I think... Yeah. We're nearing the end here. We are nearly, um, nearing the end. So, and again, anyone that has questions or thoughts or comments, please pop them in the comment section below as we start to sort of bring this all together. Yeah. So look, these are just some, some key thoughts. And some of them are repeats of what we've discussed. But first one is, look, just attain that basic understanding and familiarity with the regulatory framework which you're working in so it's coming back to okay who's going to be the decision maker um do i need to look at the the edq's product development area am i looking at the local government plan scheme do i have those state interests so use all those available tools that i've shown you and, and this is by no means an exhaustive list of all those tools as i said most of those councils mm -hmm. will have various mapping available um, and as much as it might not be immediately apparent at the, the front interface of the council website, do a search because you might find uh, you know, a great little link to stormwater infrastructure or, or some other background extrinsic material which is relevant when you're doing subdivisions or development. Consider things like topography, access and aspect. Haven't really spoken on that in great detail, but in terms of mastering a subdivision, you want to know are you falling to the street? Are you falling away from the street? Now, you might find yourself a great opportunity for a quick little one into two subdivision. You go, this is great. No constraints. I've got good road frontage. But if it falls away to the rear, you know you've got to deal with your stormwater somehow. And that obviously adds to the complexity because you can start to involve adjoining property owners. So mm -hmm. it's consider all of those things. And one of the maps I haven't shown it tonight is you know contour mapping. Contour mapping is quite often available through those local authorities. So even at that desktop view, you can start to see and get a picture for where your site falls to know whether or not you know, um, stormwater is going to be an engineering issue uh, or not. Um, that was Geography similar... 101, wasn't it, Tim? It is. It is. Absolutely. <laughs> the lines are close together. That means it's steep. It's steep. Yes. yes. There you go. Yeah. Or you don't have enough contours turned on, possibly, yeah. as well. So, yeah, the other key one there is assemble the experience project team. I guess that is pretty important. Um, and, and look, we'd all be doing that anyway um, through whatever business that we do. Yeah, you've got your consultants, your peers, uh, your contacts that you rely on and trust. Keep those close by and handy mm. because you know, engaging with a planner for a 15, 20 minute phone call or email um, yeah, discussion and a couple of quick searches might save you hours of, of unnecessary searches and, and you know, time spent doing DD for possibly an opportunity that doesn't quite sort of stack up to, to what you want. Um, but you also need that project team to help navigate the application process once you do land on that side and do commit to running the development. Um, identify the decision makers, I've sort of touched on that. Just as you engage with your project team earlier, uh, or early, you want to engage with the decision makers early. Um, most councils, and I'm assuming this is the same interstate as well, will have a pre lodgement service where they will be happy to sit down, discuss development concepts with you prior to making the application. And that's a great opportunity just to square away any particular local nuances, um, you know, uh, whether they want a particular report, whether they want a plan designed in a particular way, so once you make your application, you're not being asked to make amendments or supply a lot of more information mm. during that assessment time. Um, that kind of follows into isolated areas of non-compliance. Um, you know, it's not always you know, going to be a case where you tick every box against the code. You're going to find yourselves at a point where you don't hit a minimum frontage or a minimum area or you don't do something. And, and it shouldn't necessarily be a showstopper. You should be able to work a way around it. And, and quite often through the performance-based planning system that we have in Queensland, at least, you can propose alternatives to achieve the policy outcome. So it's identifying those areas of non-compliance and whether or not your project team can form those cogent arguments to go, okay, well, you know what? We don't have the 600 square mile lot. We're at 580 square metres, but we are that because of these reasons. 
Mm. We're not impacting the ability for the site to be developed with a dwelling house, and we're not doing a subdivision which is out of character. And you can start to build that kind of argument with the um, um, with the council and, and get them on board early. Mm. Um, preparing the development application with with a lot of material is useful. Um, again, this comes from my experience in both private sector and local government sector. The more information that you give the council up front as part of the application, just the easier it is to assess because you're not teasing out information uh, and amendments through the DA process. You are trying to come in with all the information up front and make the council officer's job as easy as possible to assess. Um, second last point is pretty obvious, but it's always hard to get, is parity across all the different consultants. Now, I know that we're all engaged with different consultants at the exact same time. We're all rushing to get to our project milestones. I'm speaking from current experience because we're all doing this right now in the lead up to Christmas. So you've got an engineering report coming in, you've got an ecology report coming in, you've got a traffic report coming in. Mm. Make sure that they're all talking about the same thing. Make sure we're not yeah. conflicting with each other um, because all of a sudden you might have good traffic grounds for a subdivision, good ecological grounds for a subdivision, good engineering grounds for a subdivision, but if some of these, these specialists and experts are conflicting with each other, mm, mm. then all of a sudden the subdivision opportunity is really you know, detrimentally affected. Um, and then, yeah, just communication, illustration and um, articulation of your arguments. So, again, it's all just coming back to that information of being well-informed, um, having that project team uh, all on the same page and you're know, working towards that one result. Fantastic. Tim. So for those of you who are looking at doing subdivisions in Queensland, obviously Tim's got a bit of knowledge around it. Um, that was fabulous. That was that was a wealth of information. And I know you could have kept going on in terms of the details, but this is sort of higher level, you know, if there if you're if you're not doing these already, I and mean, these are things that you can do yourself on a desktop. Mm. That's the key that's the key thing because developers constantly looking for, for projects but that doesn't remove the fact that you need to like you've mentioned a few times have oh. your core team around you have your oh. core team of consultants um so what are the what are the areas that you look at um in dts tim and 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 your role yeah so my role at dts i'm one of the planning managers here um we're a smallish team of around about nine to ten town planners but we are largely a surveying and urban design firm as well. So we've got the ability to draft up subdivision plans, draft up mm. ROL plans for your development applications, do the survey uh, and bring all of those skill sets together. Um, but my day-to-day -day stuff is, is running you know, my part of the planning team. It's working with my clients to do exactly as I explained tonight. My clients will come to me and go, great, Tim, found the site, found this opportunity. And I'll go through and I'll work out you know, are the state interests going to be insurmountable to a, a subdivision opportunity? Mm. What does the local plan scheme say? Are we in the infrastructure area? And, and then start to formulate the strategies around how do we overcome any of these potential barriers or constraints as we see them on a plan? You know, obviously I, I prefer the sites that my clients bring to me, which is flat, rectangular, no trees, no koalas. Um, <laughs> okay, that's great. You know, th those ones are easy, but they aren't there, you know, the, the, the easy yeah. stuff is um, it's hard to find. So yeah. there's always the, the land where you go, okay, well, look, most of it's going okay. You know, I'm in the right zone and I've got good aspect and I've got a good area, but there's a couple of trees at the back. And so we can yeah. look at you know, the opportunities of going, okay, well, the trees aren't mapped. Um, so, you know, through the various exemptions in the framework, we think that that shouldn't be an issue. Or if we can see some real pertinent showstoppers, yeah, we can um, draw upon our, um, you know, our network of consultants as well to put our clients in contact with possibly the ecologist or the stormwater engineer mm. or whoever they might need to speak to if they don't have those contacts in play to try and resolve those issues to a point that you know, we can all move forward with the next step of you know, possibly plan drafting and then start to have that initial dialogue with the local authority. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for your time putting that all together. That was that was excellent. I learned a few things from it, um, which is which is good. I'm always always keen to to broaden my own knowledge, um, and there was there was a lot in there. So you've you've applied yourself well from from high school. 
<laughs> high school days <laughs> in indeed so thank you i appreciate you sharing um that sort of wraps up our our evening and the presentation for today so thank you for those of you that have joined us today if you want to get in contact with tim there are his details on the screen yep, there absolutely. mobile phone email he is also on in facebook land um but yeah it's a busy time so maybe projects for next year yeah always happy to talk but uh yeah it's uh, christmas can't come soon enough for most of us i think yeah absolutely so thank you thank you so much for joining us on the business of property we'll see you again soon have a fantastic christmas um tim i'll see you in the new year and everyone yeah, else as well so. Next next week will be our last episode of the business of property. And uh, make sure you visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel um, if you want to find any of our past business of property videos. And if you found value in our show, please subscribe as well. So until next week, we shall see you again. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Bye, bye.